But anyway, uh, welcome, welcome everybody. I'm so glad you're here today. And so Pastor asked me to uh, to bring the word, and uh, he asked me about a week and a half ago. And so uh, so when he asked me, he told me uh, uh, just just pray and, and read your word. And uh, that was the instructions that he gave me. So so uh, that's what I did, right? I, I prayed and I and I. Uh, read my word uh, daily, and, and so I prepared uh, the best that I could so that um, I could hear from the Lord so that I can uh, bring you the word from God, right? So uh, so I just want to pray right now, and if you will um, bow your heads, I want to pray. Um, Father God, Lord, we just thank you, God, for this morning, dear God, and Father, I just want to give you all the glory here today, Father God. Lord, I pray that, Holy Spirit, you guide every word that comes out of my mouth today, Father God. Father, I pray that my flesh be put to shame here this morning, Lord. And so, Father, I pray that your word will extend out uh, over this congregation, Father God, and touch every heart out there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So, so it's a beautiful day. Uh, Yesterday was beautiful too, right? The sun was out. It's warm out here. Pretty soon the church is gonna start filling up. You know, you know, in the winter time, uh, the church will get empty. Uh, everybody wants to come out in the winter time, right? And you'll see that the church get empty. But now it's gonna be nice outside. It's gonna start filling up. And so praise Dada. God for that. Um, so yeah, let's get started. <laughs> um, I want to share this story, and this is a story that uh, God laid on my heart, and I read this story, and, and it touched my heart. So I just want to read this story to you. And so, August 16, 1987, Detroit Metro, uh, Detroit Metro Wayne County Airport, a uh, commercial airline, takes off heading to California. Flight 255 made its takeoff roll on Detroit's runway 3C at approximately 8.45 p.m. Captain Moss was at the controls. The plane lifted up off of the runway at 170 knots. So that's 195 miles per hour, 170 knots, and soon began to roll from side to side at a height just under 50 feet above the ground. The MD-82 went into a stall and rolled 40 degrees left when it struck a light pole near the end of the runway, severing 18 feet of its left wing and igniting jet fuel stored in the wing. It then rolled 90 degrees to the left, yeah, yeah. struck the roof of an Avis car rental building. This plane, now uncontrolled, crashed, inverted into, onto Mid Belt Road and hit vehicles just north of the intersection of Wick Road. The aircraft then broke apart, skid across the road, and disintegrated and erupted into flames as it hit a railroad overpass and the overpass of an eastbound Interstate 94. Now this story touched my heart uh, because that was a tragic accident. And uh, I probably don't have to tell you all uh, that in the midst of this accident, there were 155 passengers aboard uh, flight 255. <laughs> but out of the 155 passengers on flight 255, there was a four-year-old girl that survived this horrific crash. And so despite of this tragic accident and this tragic crash, for me, what I seen was God's hand on that four-year-old little girl's life. 
And so they found this little girl strapped to a seat in the middle of this wreckage um, with fuel burning all around her. And so, and so my message with that story was that God had his hand on this little girl's life. Amen. I believe that God had a plan yeah. for this little girl's life. That's right. And so today, if you research that story, you'll, you'll see that uh, this little girl is now a young lady. Um, she's married, uh, and she was adapted into a Christian home. And, uh, and they took care of her, and I believe God is working in her life, right? I didn't go deeper than that. Because I believe that amidst that tragedy, and amidst that situation and that accident, God had his hand on that situation. Amen. Amen. God knows. That's right. God knows your situation. God knows my situation. And despite of what you see, God has his hand on your situation. And so my message today was God's plan and your purpose. Right? I heard a pastor one time say that there's uh, the two greatest days in your life is the day you were born and the day you find out why. So the day you recognize your purpose in life, uh, that's one of the greatest days in your life. So I believe God has a plan and you have a purpose. But if you would, if you have your Bible, I would like for you uh, to turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. And we're going to be in the first chapter of Jeremiah. And so we're going to be in the first chapter of Jeremiah. And I am going to start at verse 4. And so I'll read verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. O oh, sovereign God, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord says to me, Do not say I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations, kingdoms, to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see a branch. I see the branch of an almond tree. I replied. The Lord said to me, You have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. Father, I just want to thank you for your word, dear God. And Father, we just pray, Lord, that your word impacts and touches what it is meant to do. Father God, it be for your will. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. So the story of Jeremiah, and maybe uh, and maybe a lot of you know it. I know there's a lot of Bible scholars here to this morning, and so a lot of you, I'm sure, probably know the story of Jeremiah. But I'm just going to give you a little bit of history or the genealogy of of, of Jeremiah and how I know it. Um, so Jeremiah was a prophet, and uh, and just and just so that uh, you know. There are some, a uh, lot of religions out there that, um, that recognize Jeremiah as a prophet. Um, and they may not recognize a lot of others, but uh, uh, there are some religions out there that recognize Jeremiah as a prophet. But, uh, but that was interesting to me. Um, when I started to uh, read and try to understand the life of Jeremiah. So it has been interpreted that Jeremiah spiritualized and individualized religion insisted upon 
an individual's relationship with God. So, so Jeremiah brought this relationship thing into this uh, religion world, right? Where all of these uh, um, uh, rituals and, and things like that were taking place. Jeremiah focused more on, he wanted to tell the people, he focused more on relationship with God rather than uh, all of these other religion aspects. And so Jeremiah had a purpose, and Jeremiah's purpose was to warn uh, the people of Jerusalem, right, that the Babylonian army in captivity was coming to wipe them out, right? And so, so his purpose was to reveal the sins of the people and explain the reason for, for the impending disaster, and, and that, was, that was Jeremiah's purpose. And, and God instructed him uh, to say what I tell you to say, right? To bring the words that I give you. Uh, and so in that time, though, Jeremiah had uh, faced a lot of adversity and had went through a lot of stuff. Um, and a lot of people, as you can imagine, had turned against Jeremiah, including family brothers um, as he carried out God's work. Isn't that funny? And, and the Bible talks about that. And you're, you're coming to, uh, to bring God's uh, word and, and to carry out God's will uh, and you will be prosecuted and the Bible tells you that, right? Um, as well as all of the disciples were. Um, but Jeremiah um, as I research Jeremiah, um, I could not find uh, how Jeremiah's life ended. Right? I could not find how Jeremiah's life ended. Uh, but I do find in the Bible where it says that God told Jeremiah that you're going to die of natural causes. So the Bible tells us that. And, uh, and so Unlike the disciples, um, they, they have uh, died in these uh, different ways of crucifixion and things like that. Uh, um, I couldn't find the ending of Jeremiah's life. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm sure that uh, Bible scholars out there have put together a timeline uh, for Jeremiah's ministry and, and, uh, and, his, um, and the end of his life. Um, and so I found that, but yet I couldn't find uh, how he had ended, or how his life had ended, I'm sorry. And so, but through that, but through Jeremiah's life, um, Jeremiah was attacked by his own brothers, as I told you earlier. Uh, he was beaten, he was put into uh, stocks by the priest, false prophet, imprisoned, uh, by the king and threatened to death, he was thrown into a cistern. So I don't know if you guys know what a cistern is. I had a, a, a cistern, in other words, it, it's, it, it's like a, a jug of water. And, and so they threw him in there, expecting him uh, to die, but that didn't happen. Right? Somebody came and saved Jeremiah. Right? So that didn't happen. Uh, but, um, but Jeremiah, after King uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and I, and I always I've been struggling with that word. I used to I used to get that king's name, <laughs> right at one time. Right? So yesterday as I was studying, I was struggling with this word. Right? But King Nebuchadnezzar, and I think you guys know who I'm speaking about. Yeah. Uh, he released. Um, he ordered for Jeremiah to be released from prison and to be treated well is what the Bible says, right? So despite, again, despite everything that Jeremiah had went through, uh, despite uh, Jeremiah's entire ministry, uh, despite uh, being thrown in the cistern and, and being rejected by his family, Jeremiah, 
God's hand was on Jeremiah's life. And from the very beginning, it says, uh, from the womb, the Lord knew him. And Matthew, in Matthew, in chapter 10, and in verse 30, and you don't have to go there, um, it says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even every hair on your head are all numbered. So God knows you. God knows your situation. God knows what you're going through. And there's times when you may not think that anybody else knows or that anybody else hears you. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that God knows. God knows every hair on your head. Um, their number. And, 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 um, and sometimes you, you, you may get in, in a quiet place and, and you've been reading the word and you've been praying and, and, uh, and you've, been, you've been really struggling to, to, uh, to hear from God. You know, and, and it just, everything seems to not be going right. You know, and, and, and finances are not going right, and the kids are not acting right, you know, and, 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 and some have teenage kids and they're trying to live la vida loca, right? You know, you know, and, 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 and that, and, and, and my wife is not uh, responding. And, and, and you got all of these uh, things in your mind. And, and, and they will distract you from understanding the fact that God knows and that he hears you. And that if you take time out to listen to him, he will talk to you. So, so I mean, so Angel, how do I know uh, when God is talking to me? Or how do I... How do I know uh, how to hear from God? Um, well, like I told you in the beginning, when I started to prepare uh, for, for coming up here today, and I'm not a pastor or a, or a preacher, uh, but I, 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 uh, I was honored um, for this opportunity. And I took it very seriously. It was very serious to me. Uh, and and um, and to God be the glory, right? And and uh, and so when I started to prepare, how did I prepare? Uh, just like my pastor told me, I got into prayer, right? So if we shut all these lights off right here, and it's pitch black, okay? And it's pitch black, and and Mariah says, "Hey, angel." You better believe I know that's Mariah's voice that I hear. Why do I know that's Mariah? Because I have a relationship with my daughter Mariah, right? I have a relationship with my daughter. And you have a relationship with your wife or your husband. Uh, so you know their voice, right? If you work on your relationship with God, you will know and you will be able to identify his voice from other people's voices, um, uh, from mentors' voices, uh, from, from pastors uh, that may counsel you. You will be able to identify God's voice aside from that. Now, as I told you, as I started to prepare this message, I said to myself, Honey, Angel, you know, you're not, a, you're not a pastor, though I believe God has called me, and I believe that many years ago God told me that I would speak to nations. That's what God told me many years ago. And so today there's not a lot of us in this room, but if you look around, there's many nations represented here today, Amen. right? So God had told me this years ago, right? And so, um, 
So as I started to prepare, I said, well, brother, uh, reach out to one of your pastors. I got, I got a couple of pastor friends. I got family that, that, that's, that's uh, in ministry. I have a brother-in-law that's a pastor. I have a, a brother that's an ordained pastor. He's an associate pastor of a church. And I have, I, I've been through other churches. I've been part of other congregations. So I got pastor friends. I've been to a lot of men's retreats and, and connected with a lot of different pastors. A lot of great men of God, I think, has been uh, has impacted my life, and and they are the reason why. Uh, uh, of course, not taking anything from God, right? But they helped me. They helped me, and 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 so naturally, in a situation like this one, right, um, where Pastor has asked me to do this, uh, I naturally went into thinking, well, I better reach out to one of my pastor brothers. They'll, they'll uh, gladly get on the phone with me and, and, and just tell me how to prepare a great message. And they'll give me all the PowerPoints and I, they'll, they'll, they'll coach me right through this. No sweat. Right? Um, so guess what? So I did. Right? I called one of my pastors friends, right? And this one, you know, he's hard to reach. And so I called him in the morning time before I went off to work. And I figured I'd talk to him, and, you know, for about a half hour or so. And, uh, and you know, we'll talk and then later on he'll, he'll make it, uh, you know, put it in his schedule or whatever in the nighttime to, to, to call me back. And then we can get to, you know, he, he, he can help me out. I reached out to my brother Richard, right? This, that, that I know for some years, and then I said, Brother Richard, help me out here, right? Tell me how to prepare this message or whatnot, right? Uh, well, Brother Richard said, you know, I, I got a busy schedule, right? But I can, I can, we can meet together this day uh, and try it that way. Well, that day, something was going on, uh, and we just couldn't make it. And then the pastor uh, uh, that I called, uh, he didn't answer. I left it on his voice, but he still haven't returned my call. <laughs> right? right? And so for me, for me, God was telling me, seek my face, son. Right? Seek my face. Hear from me because your pastor told you that I want you to pray and to read your word because I want the people to hear straight from God. And whoever is here, uh, whoever didn't show up, uh, but the people that were here, I believe this word is from the Lord and it's for you. So we went over, so we went over um, the life of Jeremiah a little bit and, 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 I, and I went through uh, to tell you all uh, that God knows and, and, and that and that there is not a leaf falling from a tree with God not having something to do with that. Right? And so the hairs on your head are numbered. Uh, and right now I want to just To Ephesians 1:11, and it was it was uh, another verse that the Lord gave to me. And so Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 says, "In Him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him." Who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. So you look around and, and, and you let your situation, or some of us, look around and allow your situation or, or your upbringing 
or your background um, or your circumstances dictate to you uh, your destiny. Uh, you will allow that. And so that's your choice. Right? Because the Word of God here tells me that in Him we were all chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will, it says. Right? So, so in short, I say to you, don't allow your situation to speak to you. Give it to God. Right? Bring it to the Lord. Get in your quiet place. Right? Get in your quiet place. Seek God's face. Give Him your burdens. Right? And if you give them to Him, if you give them to him, don't pick them back up. <laughs> if you give them to him, then you give them to him. Amen. Yes. Right? Yes. God is greater than your situation. Right? God is greater than that tragedy with flight 255. God is greater than what's going on in the Middle East. God is greater than what's going on in Madison. God is greater. And my word to you is to put God in front of your situation. To put God center of your situation, be it your marriage, be it your business, be it your children, right? God is greater than anything else that you see. Now, I want to share a story with you. And this story is a personal uh, story, right? And so, and so, um, so this story for me, uh, this is a hard story. And what God said to me, and I couldn't get away from it as I'm preparing for this message, right? I couldn't get away from it, and I tried to, I tried to. Um, you know, I, 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 I tried to have a discourse with God and, 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 make, and, and make all of these different uh, um, excuses of why I shouldn't, uh, you know, share this story, right? I, 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 I tried to figure that one out, and, but God said, I'm going to use that story, right? I'm going to use that story. Because I have a plan, and you have a purpose, right? So, so this story for me, um, I'll just tell you a little bit about me so that you kind of understand. A lot of people already here know me. Everyone, uh, pretty much, really, uh, know me, right? And know of, uh, and know of me a little bit, right? And so, um, so, so I grew up in in uh, uh, raised by a single mom. There were three of us. Uh, there was a, uh, I had a brother and I had a sister, and it was myself, right? But out of us three, we all had different dads. We shared the same mom, but we shared different dads, right? And so mom, mom did the best that she could, and God bless my mother, right? She is a wonderful woman of God, involved in ministry today. Um, Strong woman, strong woman, right? Been living in the uh, uh, inner city of Chicago all her life. Still there, won't ever leave, 
doesn't want to leave there, right? Going up three flights of stairs with groceries, right? Uh, she's there. Uh, you know, I go visit her sometimes. I went to visit her, and, and she says, Hey, they've been shooting out here every day after school, you know? But to mom, that's where she stayed. That's ground zero for her. She's, she's men doing ministry there, right? That's where she believes she's needed. Now, I believe, you know, and, and it, it was where God calls you, right? But so, so, so mom had um, a girl and two boys, uh, and we all had different dads. And, and um, my, my, I didn't know uh, my brother's dad, and I didn't know my sister's dad, and they didn't know their dads. Um, they didn't know their dads. Uh, their dads were never around. And you would hear growing up, you would hear some negative things about their dads shot around the house sometimes, right? Um, but they didn't, they didn't have their dads. But me, but me, I knew my dad. Now, my dad wasn't in the same uh, city with us. Uh, him and my mom separated when I was really young, uh, a year into their relationship, something like that. And, uh, and so my dad was originally from Brooklyn, New York. And so, and so my dad was, was there. And, uh, but my dad, he still, uh, he sent uh, birthday cards, Christmas cards. And back then, back then, long distance was, uh, was expensive. So you weren't making too many long distance calls back then, right? But I'd be able to get on the phone with him, you know, once or twice a year, right? And even from then, from there, I thought that my dad loved me. And even from there, um, no one slandered my dad in my house, right? My dad was respected. My dad, all I heard about my dad was that he was a good man, right? So it made me poke my chest out a little bit, right? Because guess what? Where I grew up and in my culture, uh, dads were not around. That wasn't an uncommon thing where I grew up at, where, where dads were part. So all my friends didn't have dads. I mean, my brother and my sister didn't have a dad. But guess what? Angel had a dad, right? I felt like Angel had a dad. So when I came to this, um, uh, when I got a little bit older, you know, and, and, and my dad and my mom had this good relationship, you know, and so when I got a little bit older, um, they said, um, you know, they worked something out. Uh, I'm gonna, you know, I'll send your son. I'll send you over there to New York City. You can spend some time with your dad during the summer times. They worked it out. So, you know, and it came to the point, I think I was maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe seven, eight, seven years old. And somehow made that first trip out to New York during the summer. They put me on a plane by myself, right, shot over there. And, and um, you know, the stewardess would take care of you. Right? And, so, and, so, and so then, you know, I get over there uh, to New York where my dad is living with his um, sister. And they weren't living in the greatest New York. They were living in uh, projects in Brooklyn, New York, right? and so there was a rough area. Um, we couldn't even go outside. Right? Going outside was out of the question, right? We had baseball diamonds and stuff set up in the living room, right? You want to play baseball, basketball, play it in the living room. You can't go outside, right? And, and so I would only be able to go outside with my dad. Right? My dad would work and uh, my aunt would take care of him. And I had my cousins and stuff. Uh, but I, during this time, I developed this great relationship with my dad. But I tell you, my dad, he loved me. You know, I was his only son and, and, and he loved me. Right? And all he could ever tell, he, he loved me. He felt that I was really respectful. If he brought me into other people's houses, I was always quiet. 
and running around and doing, you know. And then he always used to tell me, everybody likes you. And he would rub my head. I had like long hair, right? It was straight. And he would rub my head and he'd tell me, everybody likes you because you're respectful. I remember that about my dad. I remember that about him. And so, um, so throughout that course of the time, I was growing up and I was going, we were trying to get, or they were trying to get me out there every summer, right, trying to work it out. It just depended on dad's situation and mom's situation. And sometimes it would work and, and sometimes it wouldn't. And that was okay, right, because dad sometimes even made a trip out to Chicago and been out, was out there for a week or, or whatever. And, 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 and he, you know what, he expressed to me that he loved me. So I didn't feel like I didn't have a dad. I didn't feel like that. But, but then came a time, and uh, I was about 12 years old. And uh, <coughs> it was around, it was in December. Towards the end of December, right? And, um, you know, uh, we're already, my, my sister and my brother has left the house. And so I'm with my mother at 12, and um, uh, my sister comes to the house. She's crying, right? Because even them, even my sister and my, and my, and my brother love my dad, right? And so she comes to the house and she says, your dad is really sick, right? She's really sick. She's crying. She said, you're going to have to go out to Puerto Rico. My dad was in Puerto Rico at this time. You're going to have to go out to Puerto Rico with your uncle. And um, and uh, and go see your dad. Your dad is really sick, and so I didn't understand that at twelve, right? But I knew something, right? And so okay, we packed them, packed me up, uh, shot me out there um, to Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, a lot of family. All oh, my my dad's family had a big family, a lot of brothers and sisters. Um, and they all loved me because they all loved him. And I was his, they, I made up him. He was one of the youngest ones. And, um, and, I, and I was his, his only son and, they, and they, they, they just loved me. So when they see me, even till now when they see me, they just love me, you know. And, and um, so they were all happy and stuff to see me, but everybody was uh, in a bad place. They were distraught. Because my dad was really sick. Um, so I go see my dad in the hospital, um, and I couldn't recognize my dad. He was so sick. Right? My dad uh, was weighing about 70 pounds, and he had lost uh, part of his hair, and his eyes. I remember were cross-sided because my dad had contracted a disease called AIDS. And at this time, uh, people didn't understand AIDS. And so AIDS was, uh, uh, and, and, uh, it was a scary disease at that time. And it was killing my dad. And they had my dad in the hospital, uh, like in this quarantined area, where you had to go through plastic and stuff. The place was closed off to see my dad. And so I go there to see my dad. I'm 12, and I see my dad in this condition. And I couldn't understand that at 12 years old. I couldn't understand why my hero, the one I felt so proud of having, was in this state and was dying right before my eyes at 12. It was hard for me to wrap my mind around. And I struggled with it for many years after. Just the whole thing. Just seeing my dad. Or just um, 
or just the pity that everybody had for me because I was 12, right? So I struggled with all of that for years to come, right? Um, so come December 25th, 1987, my dad, my dad he lost his, his fight with AIDS on Christmas Day. Right? So I went through um, my life uh, every Christmas day, the day that we celebrate the birth of Christ, the very thing that has gave us all salvation was a hard time for me. Right? Because I lost a very important person in my life on Christmas Day. And so, uh, for a long time, I tried to put on uh, a smile. I tried to put on a smile because my children, I didn't want them to have to uh, be sad on Christmas Day, right? But God knows I didn't want to celebrate Christmas Day. I didn't want to do the presents. I didn't want to do the food and the getting together and all of that. I just didn't want to do that, right? I just didn't want to do that. So like I told you before, um, I, um, I struggled for years to come. And I probably looked for everything out there to fill that void in my life. To fill that void in my father, in my life. I probably found everything, you know, I looked for everything out there. Right? And, 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 and I could not fill that void. I couldn't get rid of that, that, uh, that hurt in me. But you know, I got to be honest with you all today. Um, I got to be honest. I talked to a pastor one time, right? And this pastor had told me that, um, she said, Angel, you're going to have to let that go. I was already grown up. She said, Angel, you're going to have to let that go. She said, guess what the enemy does? She said, she described it like this. She described it as a piano. She said, every day on Christmas time, the enemy hits that piano key on you. Ding, 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 ding. And takes your joy, right? And puts depression and sadness in you. Yeah. Now, there's nothing for me to be sad about, right? I live a great life. Right? I live a blessed life, you guys. I have two great kids, everybody. And guess what this, though? You could, you, could, you could be a person that don't like me very much or don't even respect me, and you still come up to me and tell me, man, Andrew, you're a good father. How many people has told me that I am a good father? That's God. To God be the glory. Amen. 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 Right? Amen. Yep. People would describe me as a good father. My kids describe me as a good father. And I didn't, I didn't get taught that. God used my situation Right? Because I had a purpose and I'm raising children today. And so right now that's my purpose, right? And discipling my kids, right? And God had this plan. And despite that tragedy that I went over with you guys, despite what I had seen and what I had struggled with for those years, God 
anointed me as a good father. So today I can stand here a pastor or a preacher, but I'm a good father, right? I'm a good father. I love my kids, and my kids love me, right? <laughs> and so, and so, but God used my situation, folks. And nobody, um, nobody taught me this. Nobody uh, gave me the keys or the notes uh, to go across to be a parent. Uh, you know, the pastor tells me, parenting is not for wimps. So all you uh, parents out there, or all you that are not parents out there, understand that parenting is not for wimps. My pastor says that all the time. But, but despite all of that, uh, God used me, and I believe God will use you, and I believe God or use you no matter what you've been through or no matter what you're seeing in your current situation. I want to encourage you today to give it to God. I want to encourage you to let that go as that pastor had told me. Um, uh, to let that go, oh, what's that saying? Let go and let God, right? Let that go and let God and give it to the Lord and hear his voice and he wants to speak to you and he wants to meet you right where you are today and that's that's my word today I just I just want you if you could please stand with me we're gonna we're gonna close here and I'm not gonna take up any more of your time and I know we want to get out to lunch and, and we want to get out and enjoy this beautiful day and, and God has spoken to us today, I'm sure of it. And but if you put some music on, Brother Richard, I, I just wanna um I just want you to uh agree with me in this prayer. Because today I want to pray and I wanna allow the Lord to live whatever burden you may have, whatever situation or circumstance you walked in here with today, the one that maybe you're putting uh, uh, or you're making greater than God is today, today I just want to pray. I want to pray. And I want God, I want you to allow God to take control of that situation, of that marriage, of that child, of that business. I want you to give it to God today. So if, with every head bowed, every eye closed, Father, we want to hear from you today. Lord, we want to you to hear our hearts, Father. Your word says that you look at the heart. So, Father, today, God, you hear every heart. You understand the complexity of every situation and every circumstance. And today, we make you ruler and king of that situation, of that circumstance, of whatever pain we may have endured in the past, Father Lord. I want to give it to you today, God. And so today, today I just want to give, folks, I just want to give somebody, someone, an opportunity to give it to the Lord. Now, now I'm not going to have uh, people up here praying for you. 
But today, I want to be like Jeremiah, and I want to individualize you with your relationship with God. I want to focus on your relationship with God, your personal relationship with God. And if today, if God is tugging at your heart, and you feel him tugging at your heart, and maybe something that was said here today impacted you, or if there's a situation that maybe you know you can't control, it's making you frustrated and angry, I want you to make your way up to this altar. And I want you to meet God up here. And like I said, no one will be here praying for you. I just want you to zone in on your personal relationship with God today. Because God wants to deliver you. God wants to live your burdens here today. And so I just want you to know that God will meet you and you need to take a step and meet him. But he's waiting for you. So Father God, you hear every heart, Lord, and you know every situation as we declare and today we declare you ruler and king of our situations, Father Lord. We lift up your name here. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you stretch across this church here today, God. And give your people, peace and comfort. Father, I pray that you exalt your people and everything that the enemy has stolen from them, that you multiply a hundredfold, Lord. And Father, I pray, Lord, God, that today, whatever we came in with, we won't leave here today with you, Lord. I pray and declare, Lord, that the enemy will not have the ability to touch that key, that piano key in my life anymore. And so, Father, today, God, be glorified. We magnify your name here in this place, Lord. We give it to you. We praise your name. We adore you, Lord. And we make you ruler and king over our situation. In Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.